Okay, so good morning, everyone. We're one last grand rounds before the end of the year. <laughs> um, so we today we have uh, Marie Zerjav, who is one of our prenatal genetic counselor extraordinaires. Um, and she's gonna be talking to us about non-immune high drops and genetic causes. Um, so Marie, the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Do you need a minute? Do you need anything? I don't think so. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. It's perfect. Okay. Great. So today I'll be talking about the genetic etiologies of high drops. I'm gonna go over a clinical overview of high drops. Um, I'll talk about some of the genetic etiologies. I'm gonna review some um, relevant cases and talk about the associated case results um, or you know, the resulting results and then explore the phenotypic spectrum of one of the case results, which I will not spoil yet. So in terms of the overview, um, it, hydrops fetalis is a descriptive term for generalized edema of the fetus. It refers to abnormal fluid um, accumulation in at least two fetal cavities. Um, these are the categories that it includes. Ascites, which is um, abnormal collection in the abdomen and is often the first sign of hydrops and present in about 85% of cases. Pleural effusions can be seen, so involving the lungs as well as pericardial effusions, uh, fluid around the heart. Skin edema, which is defined as greater than five millimeters thick, and that's often a later sign of fetal hydrops. It's also associated with polyhydramnia, so excessive um, amniotic fluid volume and placental thickening, which these um, two entities can be present in about 75% of pregnancies that are complicated by hydrops. Isolated or early collections may also indicate disease. So, you know, if we're only seeing one of them, it could be indicative of um, evolution to high drops or could also be, you know, indicative of the same genetic condition that causes multiple of um, categories that are there. The pathophysiology of high drops can be classified according to um, immune or non-immune. Non-immune refers to um, the cases that are not caused by red cell alum immunization, but the prevalence of immune causes is dramatically decreased with the development of effective RH immunization in mothers at risk. So non-immune hydrops now accounts for almost 90% of the hydrops cases, so that's what we'll, we'll be focusing on today. It's not a diagnosis in itself, but rather a clinical description and end stage result of a wide variety of disorders. It is um, life-threatening to the fetus and confers a very high risk of stillbirth, preterm birth, and neonatal morbidity and mortality, um, estimated about 60 to 90%, um, depending on the underlying etiology. And speaking of etiology, you know, it is, for those reasons, it's really you know, important to try to understand what is causing the high drops. The cause can be found in about 60% of cases prenatally and in up to 85%, um, you know, once after the postnatal um, period, once uh, further evaluations are in included at that time. Some of the reasons why it's important to determine the etiology is to effectively manage these pregnancies, as well as counsel families about the prognosis. So the risks of outcomes, um, the potential complications and the prognosis varies widely by the disease. To anticipate specific neonatal care requirements, you know, what um, comorbidities could we expect either during pregnancy or, you know, right after. Um, implement time-sensitive treatments to prevent symptoms and disease progression. So, for example, there are some in utero treatments that can um, help the high drops like in, in arrhythmias or in fetal, when there is fetal anemia, where we would um, possibly do a transfusion as well as in the immediate newborn period, particularly for various metabolic conditions to prevent that disease from, um, you know, to prevent symptoms from occurring or the disease from progression or um, irreversible damage to the baby. And then of course, risk of recurrence can be understood if we can understand the etiology and, and can be range greatly anywhere from one to 2% if we, um, if there is a de novo cause to up to 50% in some inherited cases. Hydrops displays um, significant clinical heterogeneity, and there are multiple fetal anatomic and functional disorders that can cause hydrops. These are the um, kind of the main categories that we that that 
are attributed to hydrops with um, those involving the cardiovascular system being by far the most prominent. They can include structural defects of the heart, um, arrhythmias, as well as um, vascular anomalies, and those account for anywhere from 20 to 40%, and oftentimes present in the third trimester. Um, unfortunately, the next most common category is idiopathic, where we're not able to find um, an underlying cause. But chromosome abnormalities are an extremely common cause, um, accounting for about 7 to 16%. Hematologic disorders also make up a great portion, 4 to 12 percent. These can include inherited causes like hemolobinopathies, as well as acquired causes like hemolysis and fetal maternal hemorrhage. Monogenic conditions or syndromes uh, make up 5 to 10 percent of cases. Infections are also a common cause at about 7 percent. Structural anomalies are also um, very common. Twin, to, twin transfusion syndrome, so when um, the twin pregnancy when the blood flow isn't, equal, isn't being equally distributed. Generalized lymphatic dysplasias make up about 6%, and then inborn errors of metabolism at 1% to 2%. Um, the ones, the categories that are start are the ones that I will be um, giving some examples on today. Um, there are so many different conditions, so I certainly can't go into everything, but just wanted to highlight kind of some, some examples from each category. And even though, even though we're focusing on the genetic causes, um, you know, it's important to understand the non-genetic causes as well so that you can come to the right um, cause. And um, these are some of the common infections that, are, that can be causing a high drops with parvovirus being by far the most common, followed by cytomegalovirus, toxoplasmosis, and then syphilis. Some of the unique sonographic signs that would suggest an, uh, an infection as opposed to something else would be, you know, for parvovirus, we would be, could, could be seeing anemia, but also um, calcifications of the brain, the liver, and the pericardium. Structural anomalies are very commonly the cause of high drops, and um, doing, uh, you know, a fetal anatomy ultrasound and echocardiogram are instrumental in trying to identify if that is the cause. Again, cardiac defects are the most common type of structural anomaly um, with atrioventricular septal defects and hypoplastic left and right heart syndrome being the most common. Thoracic abnormalities also are very common, particularly CPAMs and bronchopulmonary sequestrations as well as um, congenital diaphragmatic hernias. Skeletal dysplasias can also be um, causative as well as um, anomalies of the urinary tract and GI malformations that are not quite as common, and then placental umbilical cord lesions and various fetal tumors, um, such as like a sacrococcygeal tumor. Um, one thing to know is that structural anomalies might be the sole reason for the high drops, like for example, a, um, the C, I guess a CPM, or it may be one contributing factor in a red flag that there is an underlying causative genetic condition. So for example, like a comp, Again, a CPM is oftentimes can lead to high drops, but it is not um, commonly associated with any genetic conditions, whereas something like a complex cardiac defect um, is really a red flag that there could be an underlying genetic condition that is causing the um, causing that those cardiac defects. So aneuploidy is um, one of the most common causes of high drops, and it represents about seven to sixteen percent of cases. The most common aneuploidy associated with high drops is monosomy X or Turner syndrome, accounting for 42 to 67 percent of aneuploid cases. Next common is trisomy 21, which is up, seen in up to 30 percent of cases, followed by trisomies of 13 and 18. And then some of um, tetra, the, the ploides like tetraploidy and triploidy, not quite as common to see um, copy number variants like deletion, uh, like micro deletions and duplications. But if you know when we're suspicious that aneuploidy is the cause, we know it typically presents in the first and second trimesters um, before 24 weeks. And, you know, just for, you know, for those of you not, um, you know, either not that familiar or not working in prenatal so much, um, just wanted to give an, you know, a quick overview again of some of the sonographic findings that are very common for the common aneuploidies. So for monosomy X, cystic hygroma is very characteristic. Often it's septated and um, as well as an increased nuchal translucency. Cardiac anomalies are present in many cases, particularly a, a coarctation of the aorta and hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Renal anomalies like horseshoe kidney are also common. 
for trisomy 21, again, cystic hygroma and increased NT are um, very common about when we when we do see a cystic hygroma about 50% of the time we um, it can be caused by trisomy 21 various cardiac anomalies but particularly AV canal defects duodenal atresia absent nasal bone and ventricular megaly and short femur is also um, very characteristic for um, trisomy 18 cardiac defects are seen in the vast majority you know almost all cases and um, the things I have bolded are those that are particularly characteristic. All, you know, the trisomy 18, trisomy 13, and triple 80, we can all see cardiac defects, central nervous system anomalies, um, fetal growth restriction. Um, but so again, the bolded items are those that are particularly characteristic. So for trisomy 18, strawberry shaped cranium, clenched hands, and rocker bottom feet um, are very characteristic. And then in terms of the central nervous system anomalies, choroid plexus cyst is very indicative, clefts and micronathia, emphalocele and congenital diaphragmatic hernia, and then early onset fetal growth restriction. For trisomy 13, we can see a lot of those same things, but some um, things like holoprosencephaly and um, posterior fossa abnormalities are very common. Midline defects are also quite characteristic, like cyclopia, cleft lip and palate, and um, and ophthalmia. And then polydactyly is also a sign of um, more so of trisomy 13 than the other aneuploides. For triploidy, one of the unique things that can set it apart is that we could be seeing body asymmetry with relative macrocephaly and an elevated head to abdominal circumference ratio. And then when looking at the placenta also, um, when the extra set of um, chromosomes is paternal in origin, this, the placenta would be large and cystic first is small, um, a small placenta when it's maternal in origin, and then um, absence of, you know, decreased or, oh, I'm sorry, um, oligohydramnios, so absence of amniotic fluid volume. So getting into, um, you know, some more of the genetic etiologies, there are many hematologic causes of high drops, and the, an MCA, PSV Doppler, um, so middle cerebral artery and peak systolic uh, velocity Doppler. It's a really, um, you know, it's an accurate and non-invasive tool for being able to predict moderate to severe fetal anemia. And um, alpha thalassemia is one of the most common causes of high drops, particularly hemoglobin BART syndrome, which is the most, you know, severe form, which many of us are familiar with, caused by a deletion or inactivation of all four alpha globin genes, which results in 80 to 90% of hemoglobin BARTs or gamma-4 tetramers. It's characterized by prenatal onset of generalized edema and pleural and pericardial effusions, resulting from congestive heart failure um, that is caused by severe anemia and in the intrauterine hypoxia from the hemoglobin BARTs. Um, extramedullary urethropoiesis, um, hepatosplenomegaly, and massive placenta are common. And high drops from alpha thalassemia um, presents usually in the second or third trimester and usually results in a fetal demise at that time or shortly after birth. It's by far the most common cause of high drops in Southeast Asia, accounting for about 60 to 90% in that population versus um, about 10% in the general population. So quite a, quite a difference. Other hematologic causes are diamond black fan anemia, anemia um, which is characterized by profound anemia, onset usually in the first year of life, as well as congenital malformations of the upper limb, um, hands and thumbs, and some of the like uh, kidney and heart defects, as well as predisposition to certain malignancies. The phenotype ranges from a mild anemia or no anemia to just having you know physical malformations without any anemia, and then there's the severe form of a fetal anemia that results in high drops. It's an autosomal dominant condition with um, the most prevalent gene being RPS19, but about 20% of cases, the, uh, the molecular diagnosis is unknown. And there are uh, two genes that can cause excellent inheritance. Other hematologic um, genetic etiologies are pyruvate kinase deficiency, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency, and hereditary spherocytosis. So mono, even though you know that those are, you know, most of those are technically monogenic syndromes as well. Um, syndromes account for about five to ten percent of high drops. Um, you know, and if we're not thinking of those that are particular that are characterized by a hematologic cause, um, 
there are many other monogenic syndromes that can present with high drops and they vary considerably. Some of the uh, main categories are the rasopathies, generalized lymphatic dysplasias, various skeletal dysplasias and neuromuscular conditions. So I'll um, outline a couple examples of each. I know we're all very familiar with the rasopathies. Um, these are the most common monogenic cause of um, high drops. I believe within the um, monogenic syndromes category, they uh, account for about 30% of cases. So that's certainly you know, one of those um, you know, on our top differential when we see a case with high drops. Um, they describe about nine developmental syndromes uh, caused by mutations in the gene that encom encodes components of the RAS pathway. And they have a lot of unique uh, characteristics, but also a lot of overlapping characteristics. Um, so Noonan syndrome is characterized by characteristic facies, short stature, congenital heart defects, um, particularly pulmonary valve stenosis, and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that could be present in infancy or childhood and variable degrees of developmental delay, um, webbed neck, pectus deformities, cryptorchidism, and coagulation defects are also common. In terms of the prenatal findings, what we would be seeing um, are cystic hygroma, edema, you know, uh, generalized edema or in various areas, effusions, cardiac and cardiac anomalies, particularly possibly hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, and valvular anomalies would be most common. There are several genes that cause Noonan syndrome. PTPN11 um, is the most common, accounting for about 50%. And um, most of the genes cause an autosomal dominant inheritance. Um, and many cases are inherited. But there is one gene, the LZTR1, that is, it causes a recessive form. For, um, and then Costello syndrome, it can, you know, again, can display a wide phenotypic spectrum. Um, there is a very, you know, can be a very mild phenotype with Costello syndrome, as well as a, a much more severe pheno phenotype that leads to early um, lethality due to progressive high drops in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Some of the common, um, you know, characteristic findings of Costello syndrome would be failure to thrive in infancy, hypotonia and feeding difficulties short stature, developmental delays, and intellectual disability, coarse facial features, curly or sparse fine hair, loose soft skin, papillomas of the face in the perianal region, joint laxity, a tight Achilles tendon, macrocephaly, and a Chiari-1 malformation. In terms of um, you know, cardiac involvement is certainly very common with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um, and various structural defects, like particularly pulmonic stenosis and then arrhythmias can also be seen. There's about a 15% lifetime risk for malignant tumors, particularly rhabdomyosarcoma in children. Um, and then I believe so we are not always, you know, not necessarily jumping to think Costello syndrome, but um, increased NT, short long bones. Can you still hear me? Um, it broke up for a second, Marie. <laughs> I know I saw that my internet said the connection was not stable. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. So I was just um, saying, you know, the prenatal findings, you know, included increased NT, short long bones, abnormal hand posture, ventricular megaly, a large um, size with macrocephaly, tachycardia, and polyhydramnios and um, it's due to he um, heterozygous HRAS mutations that are mostly de novo. Some of the um, skeletal, skeletal dysplasias that can present with high drops are um, achondrogenesis, which is a group of severe form of chondral dysplasia where the common findings are micromelic dwarfism and narrow chest and prominent abdomen and pulmonary hypoplasia. Um, types one and A and B are recessive, whereas types two, type two is um, somewhat less severe and can be seen a little bit later in gestation and dominant. Short rib polydactyly syndrome is a, a, another group of four lethal congenital disorders that um, we would be seeing micromelia, short ribs, a hypoplastic thorax, polydactyly, and multiple anomalies of the major organs. And um, most, it's most, these are mostly uh, recessive and then uh, thanatophoric dysplasia. 
some neuromuscular um, syndromes that we can see are lethal multiple pterygium syndrome. Um, this is characterized by uh, uter intrauterine growth restriction, fetal akinesia, multiple joint contractures um, leading to arthrogyposis and the pterygia um, across the multiple joints and uh, cystic hygroma and high drops are almost always present. And then some of the other ones are spinal muscular atrophy, which uh, we are, most of us are very familiar with. In terms of prenatal findings, oftentimes we don't see anything sonographically, but we, you could be seeing an uh, increased NT as well as contract, contractures and decreased fetal movement. Myotonic dystrophy, particularly the congenital form, um, would pre, use, often presents before birth with polyhydramnios and reduced fetal movement. And then after delivery in the neonate, um, you, the main features are generalized um, weakness and hypotonia and respiratory compromise with a tented upper lip characteristic of that syndrome. And then um, arthrogryposis multiplex congenita is you know, a large group of conditions where in the prenatal setting, we would be seeing multiple contractures, pulmonary hypoplasia, um, polyhydramnios, growth restriction, micronathia, Camptodactyly and again reduced fetal movements. Well, one example of a generalized lymphatic dysplasia is lymphatic malformation six, which is due to biallelic piezo one mutations, and this is characterized by a uniform widespread lymphedema that affects all segments of the body. And there is a high incidence of high drops with this condition that either leads to death, or it could also lead to a complete resolution of the neonatal edema, and sometimes it um, only occurs in childhood. Metabolic conditions, um, particularly inborn errors of metabolism, account for one to 2% of cases, although it appears that this is an underestimate um, because a lot of the studies that I was reading on don't test for lysosomal storage disorders in, their, in the um, high, standard hydrops workup that they did. Um, so I highlighted a like, one particular literature review that looked at 678 cases of high drops that didn't have a cause. And once they um, did a particular, you know, LSD comprehensive workup in the postnatal period, about a third of the cases were found to actually be due to lysosomal storage disorders that were missed in the prenatal setting. Some of the most commonly diagnosed lysosomal storage disorders are mucopolysaccharidosis type um, 7 or SLI syndrome, where in the prenatal setting, we'd see high drops, short femurs, uh, ventriculomegaly, increased um, nuchal translucency or fold, hydrothorax, and echogenic bowel, myocardial hypertroph hypertrophy, and, a plac and placentomegaly. Gaucher disease is also, um, is, would be, is the next most common. Particularly, you know, there are a couple different forms of Gaucher disease and the, particularly the prenatal lethal form is what we would be seeing presenting with high drops as well as arthrogryposis, ventriculomegaly, microcephaly, ichthyosiforms, and uh, hepatosplenomegaly uh, and pyramidal signs. And then the next most common ones would be GM1 gangliosidosis, sialidosis, and neiman pick disease. So, now I'd like to talk about, um, I'm just gonna review two cases that are, um, I thought were interesting and that presented with, you know, high drops or um, associated anema, and uh, edema, I'm sorry. The first case is a 31 year old um, that came to us. This was her fourth pregnancy and she was 20 weeks coming just for her typical anatomy scan. And what we saw in ultrasound was a cystic hygroma, large bilateral pleural effusions, suspected pericardial effusion and high drops. The amniotic fluid volume was normal, good fetal activity was seen, and the remaining anatomy was normal, although they noted that there were the cardiac and the intracranial views were limited. So, in terms of you know, my counseling with her and the differential at that time, you know, what I was thinking in what's in, what was important to think about was that in this case, particularly the high drops was presenting with a cystic hygroma, which um, can be more characteristic of some conditions than others. So like I mentioned, aneuploidy often presents with cystic hygroma, monosomy X, trisomy 21, trisomy 18, um, as well as the rasopathies like Noonan syndrome. Um, it can also, cystic hygromas can also be seen with other genetic syndromes like multiple pterygium syndrome and the generalized lymphatic dysplasia. So those were kind of things that were higher on my mind. Um, she did have low risk cell-free DNA though. So that kind of, you know, that 
decrease the likelihood for the, you know, for one of those common aneuploidies. The MCA Dopplers were normal, so anemia was unlikely, and her MCV and MCH values were within normal limits. Um, so again, alpha thalassemia was not really anything we were considering. Um, she did not have carrier screening though, so still, you know, things like SMA or any um, metabolic conditions were possibilities. Um, we, she was counseled, you know, overall on a poor prognosis with a high rate of in utero fetal demise by RMFMs, um, but did decline amniocentesis. Um, she, you know, didn't feel that the information would affect her pregnancy decision making and also given the high drops in the already risk to the baby into the pregnancy, she didn't want to impose any further risk of the procedure. So she elected to have her blood drawn for expanded carrier screening and infectious studies, which were both um, ended up being over, you know, generally negative. In terms of her follow-up ultrasounds, she came back for fetal echo a few weeks later, which was normal. Um, about five weeks later, the uh, pleural and pericardial effusions had resolved, but the, their, their cystic hygroma was still there, small and residual. Um, so things were overall looking stable and um, a little bit more hopeful. At a few weeks later, she came back um, and now the long bones were shortened. The humerus was less than 5% uh, and the femur was um, less than the first to the uh, fifth percentile. So the lengths were lagging for their dates, but there was no bowing or fractures. Echogenicity of the bones was normal and the chest and the calvarium appeared normal. Um, so, you know, it certainly didn't seem like there was a lethal skeletal dysplasia, but possibly, you know, that was now included in our differential to one type of skeletal dysplasia. A few weeks later, she came back and the shortened long bones were still persisting, but there was good interval growth. Um, but they, there was now development of, or identification, I should say, of a unilateral cleft lip. They also saw cystic structure in the posterior fossa, and she had developed moderate polyhydramnios. So at this point, you know, with all of these findings together, we were even more concerned, and the findings were more highly suspicious for an underlying genetic condition. But again, she was, you know, I mean, already at 33 weeks, but also not interested in any diagnostic testing in the prenatal setting. So we really were not sure what was going on. At 37 weeks, she came back and the polyhydramnios had progressed to severe and um, they did decide to induce labor um, because of a reactive or the fetal heart rate was decelerating. So in terms of her results, um, she had genetic testing performed postnatally on the baby and they did find a complex chromosomal rearrangement. Um, they, what they found was monosomy of 18P, suggesting of 18P deletion syndrome mosaic partial trisomy of 18Q and mosaic partial trisomy of 20Q. Um, I found it interesting, again, not necessarily surprising, but that the self-free DNA was normal. We know that self-free DNA is not validated to detect mosaicism or segmental aneuploidy, um, but in many cases, they does come back with like some sort of a wonky atypical finding. So I just thought it was interesting that it was, you know, they didn't see anything. Um, and then I just wanted to, state that, you know, it, one of the limitations of when a patient does not elect to have prenatal um, diagnostic testing is our inability to follow up on the pregnancy outcome and any postnatal genetic test results. So that is why these results, um, I can't necessarily speak to the accuracy of the nomenclature because this is just something that was copied in her chart by another provider that I was fortunately just able to come across. Um, so I'm sure one of you probably has seen this patient and this baby. And, um, so, if, you know, feel free to jump in if you have any more, um, you know, to say about those results, but that was, you know, I don't have access to her daughter's chart. So I wasn't able to, again, to see the actual report. Um, and it's not until they sometimes get referred back to us for recurrence risk counseling that we are able to kind of do come full circle and see, you know, how the pregnancy did end up and how the, you know, the baby and the child is doing. Does anyone have any, did anyone see this, this, this baby? No? I don't think I did. Okay. Yeah, I did not see this baby yet, so. Okay. So the second case I wanted to talk about was a, a 40 year old that came to us. Um, so she was of advanced maternal age um, at 20 weeks and four days.
This was her third pregnancy. She has a healthy daughter who is um, small for gestational age, but otherwise healthy. Family history was negative other than a sister with congenital heart disease. She was referred to us due to an abnormal ultra, um, outside ultrasound. And these were the findings that they were seeing. Um, they saw increased subcutaneous edema along the posterior neck, which extended to the mandible bilaterally as well as the back. And the skin surrounding the skull was prominent, but they felt that it was probably normal at the time. There was no evidence at the time of thoracic or abdominal fluid collection. And the, the left hand didn't open, but the right hand partially opened during the ultrasound. Measurements were consistent with dating and the rest of the anatomy was unremarkable, including a normal fetal echocardiogram. So she went, by the time she saw us, she was 21 weeks and two days. Uh, measurements were consistent with dating, so there was no indication of any lagging growth. The neck and the head edema was again seen. Um, there was, the nuchal fold was increased, but there was um, no septation. Uh, the neck thickening extended anteriorly, bilaterally to the jaw. The, and then the clenched hands were again seen bilaterally. The um, MCI and PSV was normal, so there was no e uh, fetal anemia seen. The amniotic fluid volume was normal. The remainder of the anatomy was unremarkable, but overall the fetal movement was decreased. So when I um, met with her after the ultrasound, you know, we discussed the findings further, um, potential differentials, and talked about her what screening she has had, and you know what we can order for the baby or the for the pregnancy to try to you know understand what was going on. And um, this was an IVF pregnancy with normal PGTA. Um, as well as low risk cell free DNA. So, you know, the likelihood for aneuploidy was significantly decreased. Although, whenever we see clenched hands, you know, trisomy 18 is always, you know, on our mind. And I did have a patient very recently with a false negative um, cell free DNA that did end up having full trisomy 18. So, I'm never too quick to completely rule that out. Um, nuchal translucency ultrasound at 12 weeks was normal, normal maternal serum AFP. And she did have an amniocentesis performed that day, um, order, and we ordered fish, karyotype, microarray, and exome sequencing. So I wanted to just outline the progression of some of, uh, of some of the more prominent ultrasounds that she had with us. She was coming like every two weeks, um, and at about eight weeks after we first saw her, the was was about twenty nine weeks, and the measurements were you know consistent with the dates. Baby was growing at a good interval good fetal movement and tone, but the edema that was seen around the cranium was present, but it also started to extend around the abdomen as well. The hands were, hands were still clenched and the uh, moderate polyhydramnios had since developed. The next week she came back and the polyhydramnios progressed to severe. Uh, the skin edema and cranium and ab abdominal edema was still there. The hands were still clenched. And at this time we did not see any flexing or extension of any of the limbs other than three very small movements. There were no fetal breathing movements um, also seen and overall the fetal movement was noted to be decreased. So she was sent to labor and delivery that day for monitoring, but other, but then um, you know, discharged. A few weeks later, she came back and the AF, um, amniotic fluid volume was still elevated, but overall it was stable. Same findings that we were seeing, um, you know, in the other ultrasounds, the persistent edema, the persistent um, hands being clenched. Um, there were some notice of flexing and extension of the arms, but the legs still were not moving. And fetal breathing movement was seen at that time. And then the, the most recent ultrasound that she had had, um, the next finding was that the, you know, ever, all of the remaining findings were still there, but the polyhydramnios had progressed to a severe state and required amnio reduction because she was exhibiting um, symptoms like shortness of breath and starting to have contractions. So the results of her amniocentesis came back. The fish was normal, karyotype was normal, and microarray was normal. But exome sequencing um, identified a this particular variant, the heterozygous missense um, variant of uncertain significance in ACT A1, defined here. The population frequency was zero in NOMAD, and it is um, associated, ACT A1 is associated with ACT A1 related congenital myopathies, which can be inherited in a dominant or recessive pattern. 
but mostly dominant. In terms of the variant interpretation at the time, it was not um, observed in the general population. Um, the sense variants are a common disease mechanism for autosomal dominant traits. Multiple lines of computational evidence supported a deleterious effect on the gene function, and it was not found to be maternally inherited. So mutations in the ACTA1 gene can cause five overlapping congenital myopathies. Um, the most common is nemaline myopathy, as well as intranuclear rod myopathy, actin filament, aggregate myopathy, congenital fiber type disproportion, and myopathy with core-like area, areas. They have a lot of overlapping um, sim, uh, features. The majority are inherited in an autosomal dominant um, manner and less than 10% of um, are attributed to recessive inheritance. The, again, the phenotype is highly variable with differing ages of onset and severity. Um, it can, pre ACT A1 phenotype can present with severe congenital weakness with death from respiratory failure in the first few years of life. But the most common and typical form would be a childhood onset myopathy with survival into adulthood. And then rarely fetal akinesia and cardiomyopathy are reported. Um, in terms of you know, I looked at some studies and in one review that had 59 cases of ACTA1 mutations, about 90% of them were had a diagnosis of nemaline but myopathy versus the other types that were listed here. So I went, um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about nemaline myopathy and the ACTA1 related phenotype. It is a form of congenital myopathy with varying ages of onset and severity, but involves muscle weakness, hypotonia, and depressed or absent tendon reflexes. The muscle weakness typically involves the proximal muscles with involvement of the facial, bulbar, and respiratory muscles. And the hallmark of all forms of nemaline myopathy, regardless of the defect, is the presence of abnormal thread or rod-like structures in the muscle fibers um, on the histologic exam. It, can, it displays um, significant genetic heterogeneity. So there are 10 known causative genes, which with NEB being the uh, accounting for about 50%, but NEB is inherited in a recessive manner and it is associated with a milder phenotype. ACTA1 is the next most common cause. About 15 to 25% of cases are due to ACTA1 mutations. And um, ACTA1 mutations are associated with about 50% of the more severe fatal cases of nemaline myopathy. They were previously categorized into six different subtypes listed here, but because there is such um, overlap in the in the you know the features and the presentations, it's um, believed to be more helpful to categorize them into just typical and severe. So typical nemaline myopathy again is the most common form. Um, it is presents with infantile hypotonia and muscle weakness of the arms, legs, and face that leads to failure to thrive and delayed gross motor developments, but otherwise development is normal. Dysphagia and feeding difficulties are common early in life, as well as skeletal anomalies um, like hyposcoliosis, pectus carinatum, and pest cavus. And then dysmorphic facial appearance is common, a long face with a high arch palate, a tented upper lip, and retronathia. It can be slowly progressive or and sometimes not progressive, uh, non-progressive. And most adults with um, the typical form of nemaline myopathy do achieve ambulation and are able to live independent lives. Versus the severe form, which is characterized by absence um, or a little spontaneous movement or respiration at birth. Severe hypotonia and muscle weakness are seen. Um, sucking and swallowing difficulties, respiratory insufficiency, arthrogryposis or contractures, and death in the first few months of life um, due to the respiratory insufficiency. And the, the severe form uh, makes up about 10 to 20% of all cases, much less commonly a later um, childhood or an adult onset type can occur. So when um, you know, I we got this, the VUS back um, in trying to provide a clinical interpretation of the VUS um, in terms of the ultrasound findings and matching, you know, correlating with them with this result, the I highlighted in purple here, you know, kind of the things that matched. Um, the fetus did show some overlapping features with the ACTA1 related myopathies, such as the clenched hands, which could represent the contractures and the arthrogryposis that are seen in nemaline myopathy, as well as de the decreased fetal movement on the previous ultrasound. But 
that was a very early, that was, you know, a much earlier ultrasound. And at the time of these results, there was only that one ultrasound that showed that decreased movement. The remainder did show good movement and tone. Um, and it wasn't until we had these results again before the, you know, the absence of the flexing of the arms and the legs were seen. A prenatal presentation of an amyloid myopathy, like so seeing sonographic findings is, is really not that common. Um, so that was something that I was considering. And then, so, you know, overall she was counseled on the uncertainty of the VUS. Um, I recommended paternal testing for clarification of, um, you know, to see whether or not he carried it. And at this point she was 23 weeks and four days and she was committed to the pregnancy and was choosing to remain optimistic about the findings in the, you know, further testing. So in terms of um, the paternal testing came back and was negative, the ACT-A1 variant was not found in either parent. So um, which pointed to a likely de novo inheritance. It, because of this, it was reclassified as likely pathogenic. So in, you know, in light of this, these updated results, I went back to the research to try to look at some more case studies to attempt to guide counseling for this family. Um, and so I wanted to just highlight a few studies that I came across. Um, this one was a male born to healthy parents at 34 weeks. Family history was otherwise negative. The pregnancy um, was complicated by high drops. And again, I highlighted the findings in purple that matched our case. The boy presented with um, generalized edema at birth, a massive pleural fusion, hypotonia, and contractures of the fingers. He was um, did require artificial ventilation, ventilation and thoracocentesis, which stabilized his condition. Um, tachycardia and progressive kidney stones were seen, and he did um, require tracheotomy at six months and was exhibiting growth failure despite tube feeding. Um, he had some generalized hypotonia, reduced muscle volume, and prominent weakness, as well as dysmorphic facial features. Um, including a prominent forehead, a broad and depressed nasal bridge, a long philtrum, a high arched palate, hepatomegaly, undescended testes, contractures of the fingers, um, deviation of the hand and rocker bottom like feet, and his facial expression was myopathic. And at the time of the study was the last follow-up that they had, and he was two years old and was still dependent on um, artificial ventilation. And the genetic testing, I did identify him with a heterozygous de novo missense mutation in ACT1 that had not, ACT A1, that had not been previously identified um, in anyone with myopathies. Another um, study I came across didn't have a lot of details because it was um, a review of many studies, but this fetus also presented with high drops decreased fetal movement, micronathia, club foot, and polyhydramnios in the third trimester, and had a likely pathogenic ACT-A1 missense mutation. Um, but it wasn't, you know, overly helpful in terms of trying to understand what the potential prognosis was because the, temp, uh, ter the pregnancy was terminated, so it prevented any information on follow-up. And then one last study that um, I came across in terms of trying to find an association between these prenatal findings and what the postnatal presentation could be. Um, this 31-year-old woman had a, you know, this was her third pregnancy. She had one healthy male. The second pregnancy was a fetal demise that did not have any fetal movement, and the baby was hydropic in appearance. This pregnancy was, she also was not feeling any fetal movements, and the ultrasound showed abnormal fetal finger posture thickened um, subcutaneous tissue in the thorax and abdomen, polyhydramnios, which progressed to whole body um, skin edema, fixed extremities, overlapping fingers, and polyhydramnios. Um, this, the diagnosis was nemaline myopathy but in this case, but it was not due to ACTA1 mutations, but rather KLH um, compound heterozygous mutations in KLHL40. And again, there was no information on follow-up. The pregnancy did not continue. So in conclusion with this case, you know, we felt that, that they, you know, are not necessarily able to correlate the, you know, the ultrasound findings with, with being able to give a prognosis in terms of how, you know, what to expect the baby's outcome to be. Um, the pregnancy is still ongoing. 
the deliveries. Um, so it's an active case right now. She's probably going to be delivering in the next few weeks. So we, um, you know, again, one of you will probably be, you know, evaluating or meeting with this family and evaluating this um, baby in the coming weeks. So just a heads up on this case. And in summary, um, the etiologies of non-immune hydrops fetalis, um, you know, there are many genetic and non-genetic etiologies that can be considerably variable. The list of possible conditions is quite extensive. Sometimes there's only one or two case reports to go off of. Um, and hydrops tends to be the most severe form of many conditions that have a variable phenotypic spectrum. So they can be quite mild, but then there can also be this, you know, very severe form that presents in the prenatal period. Um, so hopefully, you know, the talk outlines some of the common groups um, of etiologies to think about and factors to consider to effectively manage the pregnancies as well as the, um, you know, the infants postnatally as and things to think about for recurrence risk counseling. And that is all I have. Um, thank you for having me today. And if anyone has any questions or input or anything to add, I would love to hear. Thank you so much. Um, any questions? Well, Marissa, thank you so much for, for the wonderful presentation. For the case two with uh, VUS for Act 1, was the mm -hmm. discussion option of the fetal muscle biopsy was discussed or is not option here? We did not discuss that option with her. Um, I have never been involved in a case that did a muscle biopsy. Um, is that something that you would that you would recommend? Yeah, for Nimelin, it's actually muscle biopsy would be very, very helpful, valuable to actually uh, to confirm the uh, if it's the, indeed it's a Nimelin um, myopsy um, would be very pretty valuable. It depends on what's the experienced people here. I actually don't know how how much experience people doing the uh, uh, fetal uh, muscle biopsy here. So. Um, yeah, we had a, we actually um, had a patient who, she was from Florida and she called in inquiring about, I think, I think her fetus was diagnosed with, I can't remember, a different muscular dystrophy. Um, and we had looked into if someone, if anyone here did fetal muscle biopsies and no one did. Um, I think what we came, came up with was someone in Florida to refer her to. Mm -hmm. um, but that is, you know, that's a really good point. Um, do yeah, typically, you, yeah, typically by 17, 20 weeks would be a good time to, many, many center, MFM center would be, I could, uh, would be some individual comfortable doing a fetal uh, muscle biopsy or even fetal liver biopsy sometimes. Do you know of, do you know of, of anyone like in this area that, that, that does that? Not necessarily for this case, just in general for us to be aware of. Um, I know that Texas is doing very routinely. Uh, okay. I actually don't know. Uh, uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, Texas Children's Hospital, they have one of the largest MFM center for sure. Um, uh, okay. They invest a lot for this uh, uh, this direction. So, so you may, yeah, you may refer a patient to there, so. Youngway, were they doing it at Duke or? Duke, I have not experienced anything. Sorry, my internet. Off my head, oh, yeah. Um, again. Well, we may, may have someone down this, I, I, I don't remember for my own case at, at Duke actually, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really helpful and well, you know, something to definitely consider. I, uh, for this, you know, would there be an advantage to, you know, I guess for it would be for prognosis counseling, but for this family, you know, I think that the information, it seems as if that would be much more an invasive um, and, you know, yeah. risky procedure versus doing that postnatally. Um, given that the, it wouldn't change the you know information for this couple at this point. So if if a histology come back very classical and uh, sort of the uh, staining, it's a, it's a classical. And then I mean, you counsel probably on a much severe end of the presentation, so okay. parents can have some kind of discussion options. So um, but for uh, uh, yeah, for nemulin definitely, it's, and they probably can tell by staining the, the fiber. To, oh, okay, this is a very severe uh, presentation eventually. So. That's really helpful to know. Thank you. And my second question is for the um, the uh, Newland PTP and eleven. Um, what typical time you see these hot drops for 
patient with the PTPN11 uh, pathogenic mutation? Um, you know, I'm not sure. I have not <laughs> personally had a case that has um that has progressed to high drops. Um, but because usually we see with a cystic hygroma that was usually the pre like the presenting feature, and that's usually seen in the like in the toward the end of the first trimester or beginning of the second trimester. Yes, I, I kind of we we, we kind of know also uh, this mutation is very reproducible in the very early pregnancy loss. So mm -hmm. uh, so that that's kind of interesting. The spectrum for this uh, phenotype is, can be so so wide. So it would be kind of interesting to know. Um, so the it, which stage and and the time wise. So uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I know what you mean like how much can we attribute the you yeah. know miscarriages and the pregnancy yeah. losses to this. I mean, you did a sort of uh, in, in your, your slides alluded to that uh, for this mutation, most due to this cardiac, cardiac sort of for the defect caused the heart drops. Is anyone going to look at whether that uh, lymphatic actually also contribute significant for heart drops in the uh, PTF, PTPN11 case, I guess? Yeah, I, that would be an interesting thing to try and you know, look, look into. Well, thank you so much for, for, for presenting this. Uh, very, very interesting topics. Absolutely. Thank you, Marie. Any other questions? Just from a quick little literature review, it looks like there are two or three um, papers looking at kind of the spectrum of um, genotype phenotype um, correlation with PGPN11 and RIT1 mutations involved in including um, high drops. So it's a little bit of literature out there. Okay. Okay, well, if we don't have any other questions, thank you so much, Marie, for helping us round out the year with a really great presentation um, and I wish everyone a happy holiday season. Um, for real this time, last week was mm -hmm. a, a false alarm. <laughs> um, so we'll see everybody in the new year and um, thank you for joining us for Grand Rounds. Right. Yeah, happy holiday everyone.